But anyway, I think it's really fitting. Really, a lot of these subjects I'm going to be addressing uh, with the text from Ephesians 4 about being carried away and tossed to and fro. And last Sunday we talked about from Matthew 14 with John chapter 6 and Mark chapter 6 with the contrary winds that are blowing against the church. The contrary winds of comfortlessness. And I mentioned in our getting our studies on down in Ephesians 4 that the church is fell victim. And I'm talking about the people in the church. The, the church, the true church is right. And it's perfect. It's in Christ. But in any way, the people, the church, and we're, we fell victim to being uh, blown around and beat on by the winds. And we talked about the contrary winds. Like the disciples on the Sea of Galilee, the Lord constrained them to get in a ship and go to the other side. And all oh, the contrary winds that blowed against them. And we talked about getting out of our comfort zone. And finding ourselves in a place where it's not comfortable or convenient. And that's where the church is now. A lot of the God's people going through storms. And we've sung about that a little bit this morning. But anyway, we're going to step it up and look at the callousing winds of carelessness. The callousing winds of carelessness. And the word callous and careless kind of go together, talking about being unfeeling or hardened, indifferent, insensitive, and carefree, uncaring, neglectful, reckless, slackless, unconsiderate. So I think that's where the church has fell victim. In a lot of respects, on a general sense on this day, we fell victim. We, and I'm talking about from this pulpit myself, on to you people in the pew and those that will hear later, we fell victim. We're in a careless situation sometimes and indifferent and cold and callous. But I shall read now right after I pray from Ephesians 4, verse number 9 through 16. Father, I've come to thank you for the privilege, Lord, to open this authorized King James Bible, this inspired, infallible, inerrant, eternal word of the living God. And you made a promise in Psalm 12, Lord, that you preserve your word and keep it. And you have given us this, this King James Bible for the English speaking people and promised. And, and Lord, you're, ke you're keeping your word. Lord, you're, you've kept your word and it's inspired. And it's without fault and it's eternal. And I give you praise, Lord, as we give a tribute to your word as we start our reading on this day. And I pray, Lord, you'll help us now. Lord, you'll help this little old frame of a preacher. Lord, you'll move upon my heart. Lord, anoint my lips of clay. Help me to only say those things which you won't say. And say without fear or favor of man, do you be all honor and glory in Christ's name. Amen and amen. Now reading from our text, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 9. As we start out reading and hear Paul writing to the church at Ephesus. And he said, now that he ascended, what is he but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? And he that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Notice how he puts the pastors and teachers in one category. And here's the purpose for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now he talks about, about the period of time till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness 
of Christ. And we talked about uh, uh, this thing of immaturity, this thing that has really plagued a lot of local assemblies, just people, they come to church, they don't grow, and they just remain as a babe in Christ. And so Paul's calling on us with Peter's writing to grow in grace and in knowledge of the Lord Jesus. Grow up to maturity. Grow up to the fullness of Christ. And then he said in verse 14, here's the caution now, the precaution. And he said that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slay of men and cunning craftiness wherein by they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is ahead even Christ, from whom of the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which ever joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, make the increase of the body into the edifying of itself in love. Now I start this way today and it's been pressed upon my heart and I'm going to go this way to start with today and I hope I'm not going to get, get off too much off of my lesson today. But anyway, we sit in these pews and if you're saved God's way, you're saved by grace in a person, the Lord Jesus and by a person, the Holy Spirit of God. And you, they, they, none of us in this place uh, any different. I think we've got the same on the same level of salvation, saved and kept by His mighty power. But all oh, we're on a different level in the general sense in church circles when it comes to this spirituality and and spiritual maturity and growing. We're on different levels. Not everybody's on the same level. And He's calling on us. I'm telling you, I'm going to be talking about this precaution. Again, a little bit more today, lest we forget what God said, lest we find ourselves victim of being in an immature state and not growing up. All oh, He's calling on us to remember. Take a look at ourselves and forget not. But I, I'm reading now and I'm going to deal with this Revelation chapter 2 as my setting for this, this uh, subject we're dealing on. The, the church in its carelessness. And I've chose to read from the church at Ephesus in Revelation chapter number 2. And I, I may just take all these seven as a whole and if I deal with it in the lesson today. I don't know which way I may go, but I'm going to read Revelation chapter number 2 and verse 7, 1 through 7. And this account of the church at Ephesus and Paul himself now had warned the church in Acts chapter 20 in his missionary journeys the elders of the church had called for Paul to come and he come to them and, re and reminded them of his serving the Lord and he remarked to them of his steadfastness how he kept back nothing that was profitable unto them but in his talking to these before his departure of the elders at Ephesus he said in Acts chapter 20, and I'm coming over there to read this verse. It'll be all important that you get this as we enter Revelation chapter number 2 this morning. But in Acts chapter 20 and verse number 28, and he said, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. And he's talking about the elders and the overseers, those that God has placed in a special place, enabled men, I call it, as I've been saying from Ephesians chapter 4. God has bestowed upon this church pastors and teachers and men that is put in to, to keep the, the, the watch out for the wolves and and feed the church of God. And, and oh, I tell you, preach the word of God without fear or favor. And he told the elders, he said, to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. And he said, for I know 
this that after my depart. Paul had some insight on the days of of declension and apostasy. Paul could look down the way and see that it was already in his day, but it was more, I tell you, spreading on down the way. And he said, I know that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock, and of your own selves, Paul said, of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. And I'm trying to get somewhere to connect with Revelation chapter 2, and I shall read this text in just a moment. But I'm going to be reading about this uh, this uh, the, the deeds of the Nicolaitans in Revelation chapter 2 in this reading from verse 1 through verse 7. And I really think that's where Paul's message was coming from to the elders in Ephesus in Acts 20. He is warning them that this sect would come along and they'd order up a, a order of men or priestly order. And of course the Roman Catholicism on down with the church at Thyatira and Pergamus taking in the priest and the and the archbishops and and all, all the all that that goes with Roman Catholicism and in these messages I'm going to address the the, the the fallacy of Romanism before we get through if the Lord don't come but anyway I'm reading now Revelation chapter 2 verse 1 and John writing under inspiration of the Holy Ghost right into seven distinct churches. And of course, I, I say with reading this account and what's been already said in Revelation 1, he gave us the vision of the glorified Christ in Revelation 1, the glorified Christ. But all oh, when you come to Revelation chapter 4, you see the glorified church. We've been raptured in Revelation 4. We're around the throne of God praising the Lamb that has redeemed us by His blood out of every kindred, tongue, nation, and people. But the glorified Christ and the glorified church and all in between, He gives us seven stages of the church from its beginning at Pentecost all the way down to the rapture. And so I'm reading about the church at Ephesus that existed at the end of the apostolic, apostolic age. And here he said unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, right? The angel would be the messenger or the preacher. And he said, these things saith he, amen. I'm glad he's standing at the door, amen, of our heart on this day to give us a word of God. But in John's day, here is the one that's opening this a letter, amen. He approaches seven distinct churches with a characteristic of him, all of them different, but a characteristic, an attribute of himself. And so he said, This things he has said, he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Amen. And so the seven candlesticks <coughs> represent the light bearers. You and I that are saved, we're the light of the world. Oh, Matthew chapter 5, and I studied in the early hours this morning, we're the light of the world, amen. And he went on down in verse 16 of Matthew 5 and said that you're the light of the world, and therefore let your light so shine that the world may see, and I'm paraphrasing, that the world may see Jesus in us, amen. And the, the seven stars and the seven golden candlestick. But now he's going to talk to us about, about what he knew about them. Amen. His commendation. He said, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience. How thou canst not bear them which are evil. Thou hast tried them which say they're apostles and are not and hast found them liars and hast borne and hast patience and for thy namesake has labored and has not fainted. And oh, what a commendation. Commendations of reward. And I'm talking about rewards now for that church that, that in John's day. The Lord commended them all oh, for their works 
and their labor and their patience and how they couldn't go along and how they did not condone and compromise with evil and how that they had tried them which said they were apostles and were not and has born and has patient and for my name's sake has labored and is not faint. And oh, what a full length of commendation. But now next, verse 4 now, getting right where I'm going to bring this message when I get to it on this callousing winds that blow against the church, the callousing winds of carelessness. And he said, nevertheless, I have, I have somewhat against thee. Now, when we get on down in the other churches, he's going to talk about several things. I'm going to take a few things. But here's pretty much one thing he's got against them. Because thou hast left thy first love. Now, here's his call on them to remember and his, his command to repent. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove the candlestick out of his place except thou repent. Now he's not talking about removing anybody from the family of God. That's not taught. We don't, we don't preach that in this church. We do not believe that you can lose salvation. You're saved one time and one time for all, for all eternity. Cannot lose salvation, but you can lose your steadfast. You can fall from your steadfast. You can fall from from, from your uh, from your place if you don't add to it to a place where you. I've forgotten that where you were purged from your old sins, Second Peter chapter one. But notice now he called on them to remember. He commanded them to repent. And here it says in in verse number five, and do the first works. Oh, he called them to have resolve. But he said, I will if you don't repent, I'll come unto thee quickly and remove the candlestick out of his place, the light stand, the light barrier, amen. And all in the known world at Ephesus, men Judy has been there one time and went down the, the Roman road at Ephesus and all the coldness and the darkness and all that's upon that place where Paul had preached in the theater at Ephesus and all in Paul's day and even John's day, the idolatry and all the sin that was going on. But oh, let us be reminded, thank God, you and I sit in this house on this day. God has placed us in a place of responsibility. Oh, we're saved and we've got a light to shine and we ought to let it shine in a world. First Peter chapter 2 Verse 9 said, you are, a, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of Him that has called us out of darkness into the marvelous light. Now here's this deeds of the Nicolaitans I've just mentioned. But this thou hast that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. And God never set up for the church to have a priestly order where priests individually, oh, I tell you, this thing of pastors and evangelists for the church, amen. But here he gives them now, as he gives a plea here, he that hath a year, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches, to him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Now let's just run over these seven churches briefly before I go any further today and that'll help me get a start. And I did this uh, did this in depth. I'm telling you when we started the Revelation study, it seemed like it was in 2018. But I see here the downfall of the church at Ephesus. The spiritually 
coal church. Amen. All oh, what caused their downfall, they lost sight of the Lord Jesus. All oh, that got over Him. And everyone in this house, if you're saved God's way, you can remember a time when you got born again, when the Holy Ghost regenerated your heart. And oh, how you felt so fresh and clean. And oh, I tell you, it sound like, I tell you, you feel like you go against the devil with a hickory and wear him out. But oh, now after a lot of years, I tell you, our, our hearts get cold and indifferent. So that's what I'm really trying to address to our heart on this every single one of us from myself down to you and everybody will hear this message you'll have to agree all of us have, have I tell you went down spiritual in decline and I'm doing this to show you the decline of the churches in these seven in the revelation but I see the downfall of Ephesus the church spiritually Cold. And then I see the devotion of Smyrna. Here's the suffering or persecuted church. Oh, I tell you, the, do the Lord did not have no words of condemnation. Did have no words against uh, having anything against the church of Smyrna. Many of them. Oh, the five million that were killed during the existence of the church at Smyrna. The suffering church. Oh, devoted. Amen. Oh, it should hear in Revelation chapter number 2 and verse 9 of the church at Smyrna. I know thy works and thy tribulation and poverty. Oh, what a list of things that was against them. But he said, thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. And the Lord said, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you in prison. You may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days, and be thou faithful unto death. And I'll give thee a crown of life. And I mentioned this in some of our studies of late James chapter 1 verse 12 that crown that will be given I call it the sufferer's crown a crown of life that they may endure tribulation and temptation and trials and not charge against God and I'm sure in the church at Smyrna oh there was a lot of them I'm telling you were faithful unto death amen like those in Revelation 12 we read about oh I tell you that overcame Satan by the blood of the Lamb and all oh, they love not their lives unto the dead. Now I think about all those in Afghanistan. Oh, I tell you, that have been martyred of late. Amen. All oh, would not denounce their faith, give their life for the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we've seen the downfall of Ephesus had the spiritually cold church. And here's the devotedness of Smyrna, the suffering church. But then comes the church at Pergamos now in Revelation chapter 2. And I call this the drunkenness of Pergamos. The church settled down in the world. Wrong doctrine, I'll tell you. And of course in 325 A.D. with the institution of the Roman Catholic Church, oh, I tell you, here must have been a cesspool of iniquity in Pergamos. And we've traveled there in our... <coughs> And our travels in time past, all, all the idolatry and, and all the sin that was in, in, in John's day, the city laying there dead now, I'll tell you, among all the idolatry. But anyway, the drunkenness of Pergamos, drunk on the world system, amen, mixing religion with idolatry. And... Then comes the church at Thyatira here in Revelation chapter 2. All before this chapter end, he talks about us and talks to us about the deeds of Thyatira. I call it the sinful church because they were suffering and allowing that wicked Jezebel that called herself a prophetess to seduce uh, had to seduce the servants of God to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto I. And of course the Lord sure didn't, didn't have no space, I tell you, to give in to it. And none of this sin and I do But then in chapter 3, we see the deadness of Sardis. All the church at Sardis that had a name 
that they were alive, but they were dead. And the Lord said, I want you to be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Think about in the Reformation period. I'm telling you, oh, I believe in remnant of people, but anyway, a dead church. In a, in a deceived world. I preached on that here many years ago. A dead church in a deceived world. What a sad indictment all against the church. The churches fell victim and have went careless and went cold and indifferent and went to a place where they're just spiritually dead. I'm you. And then here comes the church at Philadelphia in chapter 3. The church at Philadelphia and I call the special church. All the church that will be delivered, amen, at the rapture, amen. I thank God that if I'm going to be here when the rapture takes place, I'm going to get an instant deliverance, amen. Thank God from this wrath that's coming on the world. Revelation chapter 3, notice what he said in verse 10. Because thou hast kept the word of my patient, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon the world, all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Amen. I'm glad we fit in the church at Philadelphia, the church of brotherly love, the special church that will be raptured at his imminent period and delivered from the awful onslaught of Satan's son, the Antichrist, and the wrath to come upon this earth. Amen. But then comes the last of the seven churches. And oh, if you have been kindly listening along and seeing the spiritual decline, the declension of lay Odyssey. Here I call it the self, the self-controlled and self-satisfied and the spewed out are going to be spewed out for tribulation. Oh, I tell you what a state this church will be. And is, I tell you on this day, the lukewarm church, neither cold nor hot, in opposition against the Word of God. And I tell you, in a very status of a real deep apostasy. And I've said over and over in this church, and all oh, you can say, well, yeah, I've heard it over and over. I don't want to hear it again, but you're going to hear it again. Amen. This age of grace is going to end with the apostasy of the uh, of the professing church. And right here it is, if I know it on this day, the church that lay Odyssea, the worst of all the seven. Amen. Oh, I'm saying on this day, supreme self-confidence. They didn't see nothing wrong with themselves. That's where a lot of church folk are at today. They don't see no they don't see no wrong of laying out a church and staying at home and going somewhere else or doing something. Else. Oh, what a sad and all the churches went careless and indifferent and cold. And I'm preaching to all of us on this day. And I'm preaching to them and ain't here and hoping they hear it later. Amen. All that just absolutely have just said in their heart, the Lord's not coming. I'm going to give up and I don't care about the church. But oh, I'm telling you, this church at Laodicea, they're self-confident, they're stated ignorance of themselves. They're sure imminent danger. I'm telling you, all the perils of lukewarm. And so we've looked kindly as a whole of these seven churches in Asia Minor all the way from Ephesus all the way down to the church at Laodicea. Now for the last part of this message on this day, and I'm doing it in, in, in succession and I'll pick it up the next lesson, maybe tonight or the next weekend, Lord willing. But we're talking today on the callousing winds of carelessness. Now last Sunday, I dealt about the disciples being carried about on the Sea of Galilee. And we addressed the contrary winds of comfortlessness. Nest. But here we're talking today now on the callousing winds of carelessness as we look at the state and status and the sure condition of the church 
at Ephesus. And the word Ephesus means let go or relax. And that's fitting for the condition we're seeing with the church at, at Ephesus. The downfall, the church spiritually cold. Now we see in verse number 1 of chapter 2. And we see the Christ, the Christ of God. Here's the angel of the church writing to the church at Ephesus and said this, these things. Saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. And Brother Helen was singing right on this day about he's in the midst. Amen. And I, I sat there and, and kindly contemplated just a little bit running down through our Lord Jesus Christ. At his birth, he was in the midst. Amen. When he was born in that poor town of Bethlehem and Mary picked him up in her arms and, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes. Amen. Oh, I tell you, no place, no room for him. But oh, thank God, Mary picked him up in her arm, and he was in the midst, amen, of all those in that known day. I'm telling you, God had, in His providence, had got everything together for His virgin birth. When He had come into this world, His enfleshment, His incarnate, but He was in the midst, amen. Even at the temple at the age of 12, He's right in the midst of the doctors and the lawyers and all confounding them. Hey, oh, I'm telling you, at, at, his, at, at His death on the cross, He was in the midst. He was on that middle cross dying for the sin of mankind at his resurrection and after he arose he was in the midst behind closed doors amen oh when the disciples had fled for fear of the jews they said they were glad when they saw the lord amen he was in their midst on them too on the road to a mess going down the road and their hearts were I, I, I tell you, their hearts was, I tell you, sad. And all oh, they were, I suppose, uh, uh, maybe that he had not a robe, but all oh, he just broke out in their conversation, appeared, amen, in their midst, amen. And all oh, thank God. But anyway, in Revelation chapter number 2, as we start with this church at Ephesus, when we read Revelation chapter 1, Notice in your Bible, and I'm thumbing over a page and see if I can find this verse in Revelation chapter 1 verse 13, verse 12. John said, I turned to see the voice of him that spoke to me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst, and in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, that's the seven lampstands, the church, amen. And it said, one like unto the Son of Man, clove with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. Amen. That's him that's uh, John's making known the revelation. Amen. The vision of the glory. He was in their midst. Amen. I'm glad, thank God, when we start with the church at Ephesus, he's walking around. Amen. He's beholding. He has a right to judge every individual church. Amen. He has a right on this day to pass on to us judgment in a in a way of self-judgment. And when we see our examine ourselves before God in light of his blessed word. But oh at the church, here he is. He's holding the seven star that speaks of his power. He's walking in the midst that has to do with his presence. Amen. Oh, I see the Christ. Amen. I tell you, before the church at Ephesus. But I'm seeing now, and I'm kindly running over it again a little bit. We see not only the Christ revealed, but the commendation rewarded. Amen. I tell you, if you get anything from the Lord, you'll have to earn it right here. I'm telling you, oh, at the, or at the judgment seat of Christ. He said, I know thy work. He commended this church. I'm telling you, God don't leave it. I, I say on this day, sometimes we tell ourselves, what good's it doing me going to church? I wear myself out. 
Oh, but I say on this day, if your heart's in tune with the Lord, if you're coming for Him, thank God to honor and worship Him. If you're coming, thank God to grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord. I tell you, the Lord's not looking down on it. He's looking up at it. Amen. But He said, I know your works. I know your labor. I know your patience. How thou canst not bear them that are evil. Thou hast tried them which say they're apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. Amen. Oh, here's some commendation of reward. I'm telling you, the Lord not going to leave it out. Hebrews chapter 6, and it said the Lord... It's faithful. All oh, the Lord is faithful. I, I'm t- and I need to re- get over that verse. It won't come on my heart. But I'm going to take the time and read it. Powerful verse right here in Hebrews, t- right into, in verse 6, right into people that are saved. And he said in verse number, in chapter 6, verse 9, But beloved, we are persuaded, that means highly convinced, Better things of you, things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak for God, it's not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have showed toward His name, and that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. All oh, God is not unfaithful, He'll not forget your work and your labor of love. Amen. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, he said, as he began to close that chapter, be steadfast and unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And it may not seem very significant to people around. I tell you, people may not take knowledge of what you do for the Lord. But oh, there's a God that don't forget. There's a God, I tell you, said, be you steadfast, be unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And so we see their commendation rewarded. Amen. Not only they had born and had patience and for his name's sake had labored and not fainted. They had not grown weary. What words have come been they and not only to leave out, not only not leaving out their they're hating the deeds of the Nicolaitans. They had something they loved and they had something that they hated. Amen. That ought to be both sides of you and I that are saved in this house. We're either for Him or against Him. And if we're against Him, we're going with the way of the world, I tell you, to conform to the world. But all we see, not only their Christ revealed, their combination rewarded, but we see their condemnation righted right here in verse 4. Nevertheless, amen, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. And all this is the strong part of my message as I begin to bring it to a close on this day. Oh, I'm telling you, the Lord struck out with them on this note. They had gotten over the Lord. Amen. And that may be, <clears throat> my language may not be good and correct, but I'm saying they had got over the Lord. Amen. Oh, I tell you, I, I went to a guy that I used to work with uptown at the old dealership, and he was older than I was, and he told me many years ago, and I'd run to the car on my dinner hour and get myself down under the dash and pray on my dinner hour and read scripture and and he said boy you got a lot of zeal about you you're really excited about the things of the Lord and I was just continually talking about the Lord and his word he said one of these days you'll cool off one of these days how you'll get a little bit colder and a lot a whole lot colder what you are now and I laughed at him made fun of him disrespected what he said but there come a day his words I tell you, bore on my heart. Oh, I'm telling you, every single one in this house on this day, if you'll be honest with God Almighty, you have to say, I've been in a better day spiritually. Oh, I tell you, seem like we just cool off and settle down, get at ease and die, and get carefree 
and careless. And that's where we're I'm trying to drive to our heart on this day. How we need to recognize we're getting carried away with this carelessness. Oh, how we we need to listen to God's voice on it. I tell you, we get so cold, we just don't listen to what God has to say. We don't pick up our Bible between church time from one service to the next. We don't get on our knees and pray to God. And I really think, and I, I'm going to tell you what my preacher friend, Brother Bagwell, said. He said, I think the Lord's right now, with all this virus reoccurring, is preparing our heart for something even worse down the way. And all oh, it may be the church be on their knees begging God, uh, have our Bible open and, and I tell you, taking God's word, very word in our heart. I'm telling you, for this thing over with all this carefree attitude that a lot of church people have. All oh, they just come when they want to, give what they want to give. And God, I tell you, going to hold us all responsible of how we treat the church and how we treat one another. All more so how we treat him. All I tell you, we got over the Lord. All their condition. I'm telling you, what a sad indictment I'm seeing on this day. Their fallen condition, a firm. Oh, when we read the Song of Solomon depicting the bride and the bridegroom, and her and the bride, I tell you, her slowness. Cause his re his withdrawal. I'm to all oh, how we slow up and don't show our love to God. All oh, I'm to our slackness, our neglect. Hebrews chapter number two, right here on the pages of this Bible, and I'll soon close this message for today. But in Hebrews chapter two, notice what this Bible said in verse one. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. And he's really been directing our heart to Hebrews chapter 1. Christ, the better one. Amen. Better than the, better than the prophets. Better than the prescribed angels. Oh, I'm taking on down the list in the Hebrew. But, but he said, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we've heard. Lest at any time we should let them slip. And on down in verse number three, he says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken of the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. And I know a lot of preachers use that to speak of sinners, but it don't say reject salvation. It says neglect. And I'm thinking on this. I'm highly favored that Paul's talking about you and I that are sick. We neglect. I tell you, we just take it for granted. The salvation that God has saved us with. I tell you, saved us with an everlasting salvation, blood wars, Holy Ghost born, put the Spirit of God in it, and a lot of times we go around as though we're, we're just bankrupt and don't have anything, spiritually or physically. Oh, I say on this day, I, this slothfulness and sleepiness and slumberness and sluggardness, all under the same subject of carelessness. Oh, I'm telling the church, the Lord said, I got somewhat against you because you have left. They hadn't lost it, they had left their first love. What a sad indictment. All oh, that we get over the Lord. All oh, I'm telling you, if you really love the Lord, it won't be no problem. I tell you to battle the flesh on Sunday morning to get up and get out to the house. All oh, for that love for the Lord Jesus. All oh, for His love He had for us on the old rugged cross. All oh, I'm telling you on this day, how we need to take this subject to heart. All the callousing winds that are blowing against the church. The callousing winds of carelessness. We get careless in the supremacy of our love. We get careless in our sacrificing. You see, God's people, we're to sacrifice and to give our body as a living sacrifice unto God. Give our means, our money. Oh, I tell you, when it comes offering time, give and tithes and offering. 
Oh, God loves a cheerful giver. Amen. But a lot of times we get indifferent. And so we'll let the preacher and let somebody else do all the work and do all the giving. But all oh, indifference in serving God. Indifference in submission to God. Indifference to the soul's desire for sinners. Oh, how we, we need to really get that on our heart on this day. A world that's unsafe. And on yesterday evening, me and Brother Joe went visiting. And I had that kindly really bothered me when I went home and laid down and tried to go to sleep. And I thought about some of the people just living in little old apartment buildings and poor people that ain't got, I tell you, ain't got anything hardly. And all oh, to think about their soul condition. All lost and without God. And if somebody don't reach him with the gospel, they'll go to hell. All oh, how the church need to be, need to be concerned, not be careless about those that are unsaved. Careless toward the Spirit of God. Ephesians 4, 30 said, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. All oh, to grieve Him, to despite the Spirit of grace is a bad situation. We find ourselves that way sometimes, unconsiderate, unconcerned. And all oh, I'm telling you, and unconcerned about the second coming of our Lord Jesus. I mentioned this in the opening today. A lot of folk have said in their heart, the Lord's delayed is coming. And that's where they're at today. All oh, they're setting some war, stubbed up on God, and mad at the world. And all oh, I'm telling you, they need a just a need a, a new renewal. On the, they need a revive, and I'm telling you, all that comes in repentance. Remember and repent and resolve. And all oh, do your first work. He told the church at Ephesus, and he said, if you don't do that, he said, I'm going to remove the lamps. I'm going to remove the candlestick out of it place except ye repent. Amen. And all a little bit on carelessness on this day.